Our next speaker is well known to some of you, David Birch. You're on the air. David okay. Birch, Star Path Navigation. And the, um, uh, this is a text that a lot of us use as a primary text on marine weather. Um, David's been around in this business for a while, preceded by some time at UW as a physicist, heavy hitting scientist. Um, but for the past now 25, 30 years, <laughs> more years than we care to remember on, on some of this, Long time. he's really been a major source of information and education for the marine community. We're privileged to have him with us. David. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, you got to stand oh, up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand right here. Thank you. So he doesn't want you moving away from no. the mic. No, no, I'm get, not. So you can get the thing on the video. Also, yeah. All right, I'm, I'm going to try to stay right here. Uh, may, I, may I just say that uh, some of the slides, a lot of the slides I have have detail in them, but you can go right now and online see high resolution versions of every slide, and they're at that link. Most of what I'm going to say today is in this book. And also in the, this is the support page for that book where we, it's Modern Marine Weather, that's a tough title to keep up with. And so that support page tries to fill in. And then today I'll talk about some, uh, some new things too. Let me get started. Okay, so the, I'm starting out with there will always be a forecast. That's the, that's the premise. And now, some, like in two years ago, uh, or a year ago or something, I would say, but they're not marked good or bad. I can't say that anymore, because there's a certain amount of our science where they are marked, you know, where the probabilities are listed, and that's the sort of thing I want to focus on, on today. And, um, and so the forecasts that we get are going to be, they're going to be better than, well, this is my, my feeling, they're going to be better than what I can do on my own, uh, knowing the science a little bit. And, uh, and, but some are nevertheless better than others. And by that I mean that, well, they may be wrong. The winds could be wrong the wrong direction. But, or more likely, the timing is off. The system will come too fa faster than forecasted or slower and so forth. And we have ways to, we have now very powerful tools to evaluate that. So here's how we do it. We're going to start out and compare our own observations, our wind meter, our barometer, and wind speed and pressure, uh, wind speed and direction, with the, with the analyses, the surface, the OPC maps, and also the model forecasts. And then the second is we want to compare the forecasts with the ship reports, buoys, and ASCAT, ASCAT data. Many of the things I'm going to talk about have the background already been presented today. Uh, and then we, now this is a little bit of a word I made up, we look at the shape of the atmosphere. So there's certain properties of it that may lend to maybe a more uh, uh, reliable forecast or more dependable than others. And so we look at that. And then here's the, here's the new stuff. Let's look at the statistical models which have been discussed in detail. We have the background already today, uh, the ensemble models, and then also the national blend of models, which has uh, several uh, regions, oceanic conus and that. And these going to, the parameters of these models that we use then are the mean values of their computations plus the standard deviations of the variations, and then also the, the probabilistic forecasts. Uh, literally, the question came up about what's the probability the wind's greater than 20 knots. Well, there's now models or combinations of models, programs, that will tell us that number. And so uh, here's a, I start out with evaluating the forecast in some, on some basic level always means understanding the forecast. So to me, uh, what we, we, we recommend is we always start with the OPC data. And they have maps at the, at the uh, synoptic times, 0, 6, 12, and 18, and then forecast 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours. And so we always start out, if you're in a dock going for an ocean, passage or a race in, I mean, the sailing in Puget Sound. If I want to figure out the winds in, in Puget Sound, you know, to forecast for Puget Sound for the next day or something, I would start right out and look at those maps. I'd print out those maps from the OPC to get an overview of what, what it looks like in our part of the world. And uh, now we would, you know, we'd probably just look at the first two or something. But, and so we look at that. And now, and here comes, I have, 
I'm going to make a little uh, shout out for the text forecasts, <laughs> since they've been kind of kicked around today a little bit. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. We teach that. You have, this is another product of the OPC. It's their text forecast. Now, we can get it by email. We can get both these products by email request to sale docs. And so we get this. What we recommend is that you took the text forecast and you take the map forecast and you sit them side by side and you read them. And every time, and I, it's no hesitation here, every single time is valuable. You learn something about the text from looking at the map, and you learn something about the map by reading the text. Every time you gain your knowledge. And so in this case, this is a random case made for making slides for today. And here we learn one thing. This high is moving east at 10 knots. That's a one sentence buried in that long text. But we don't get it anywhere over here. And then keep in mind that almost all of our <coughs> sailing routes, especially northern hemisphere, are around highs. We're going around highs. So how the highs are moving is a crucial piece of information that we got from reading this text. Now, then the next step is, here's now, it looks complicated, but this, this sort of thing is now easy to do. This is a, like a, this is a GFS model, and it's overlaid at the same time Timing is crucial here, but this is at the synoptic time. And we take the, uh, uh, we take the uh, uh, GFS forecast and overlay it. We want to compare the, the model forecast to the OPC map. Now, we want to use, ultimately, the GRIB format, the, the digital data. That's the one we want to use if we can because it's so convenient. Just put your mouse anywhere you want, your wind speed and direction and so forth. You can, you can interpolate between times. It's all tremendously easy. But it's unvetted data. It's just pure GFS output. So we have to compare what did the forecasters with knowledge and experience, what did they think is going to happen? And here's a case that maybe is typical. They, they pretty much agree like that. There's a little exception here. Now, in this case, you, or where there's exceptions, you might want to lean, of course, towards what the OPC says, because they have more knowledge. Now, but there's another anomaly going, another, another special factor coming on here, which I'll explain in just a moment. But here's another text forecast. This is not a text forecast. This was mentioned a few times today. This is called the forecast discussion. That's a separate document. Both of them are online at the OPC. You can request both of them from uh, sale docs. You just, and you get the file name, and you request it. So you can get this forecast discussion. This is almost exactly what we want. And this, again, a random sample. And it says you, it describes the patterns, uh, which models were used for like first two days, second days, the role of ASCAT, the weaknesses of some models, C state models discussed. In a sense, it may tell us exactly what we want about evaluating the forecast. And let me back up a minute. Why do we evaluate the forecast as, as it enters our decision making? So if you're a cruiser, it may affect, do I go today or do I go tomorrow? I really want to go today, or, you know, or something like that. And so having confidence in the forecast would help you on a decision making. Once you're underway, it may help you make a tactical decision. Like, suppose you want a jibe, and then, but, the, uh, but your, the forecast is unclear, unclear, or it's not as strong as you would like. And it's a gamble. It's, you're risking something here. So what you might do when the forecast is, say, uncertain or not as uncertain as you like, what you might do is half of, that's another kind of loose phrase, half of what you want to do. It's like jibe for three hours and then jibe back. You see, because then that's like the, the next forecast is six hours. So you get more knowledge six hours later. So to do, it, it somehow do some uh, compromise until you're confident in the forecast before you run a risk. And so that's what that is. Oh, now I'm, I'm zooming in on this region here. Now here, here is a nuance, and I, I, I won't spend much time on it, but it's, a, it's an important one. There's the, 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 the GFS model for many years actually has multiple parameters that calculate isobars. 
And recently, um, some folks have realized that the, the one called MSLET is a, maybe a more informative tool. And so now some people have switched over to presenting the isobars it, 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 instead of using PRMSL, the standard one, which is actually sort of average, if you look at it, it's sort of average over about 80 nautical miles in a very loose terms, effectively. Whereas this PRMSL, this one adds a more details. And we can learn things from that. There's, it's a brand new thing. It's a, it's a, we have to learn about how to use it. But it'll show, in many cases, it'll show us why the wind is a certain strength in an area we would, not, we would not have detected with the other isobars. Now, everybody that has switched to MSLET calls it PRMSL. So you just have to look, are they, are they real? And that's to meet all the equipment that's reading it, the software and so forth. But uh, so are they real smooth, or do, do you see some structure? You can also do things like, uh, um, I just one last slide on this new topic. You can do things like, this is like, what is this, one isobar, one isobar. You can just go into your grid viewer or your navigation program and crank up that spacing to 0.25 isobars, I mean, 0.25 millibars. And then look at some of these patterns. You can sometimes see, normally on a grid file or a GFS model data, you can't see the fronts. You can sometimes piece it together or look at maybe relative humidity at 850 millibars or just kind of tricks you can do to see where the fronts are. But you can take this MSLET, crank it up to 0.25 per spacing, and you'll see the waves. You'll see the actual trough running right down there. And, the, and again, I have no idea how, how this is going to pan out, but sometimes you actually see little troughs in front of a fast-moving front. So it almost looks like it's trying to tell you there's a, uh, a maybe a squall line out there or, or something like that. So it's a real promising new thing. Also, I'm kind of barometer oriented, and uh, it also shows you that your, you know, if this is really better and honest to truth, then your barometer reading could be off by half a millibar by this this type of uh, uh, notation. Okay, so now I'll get down to the steps. We want to compare our measured wind speed and pressure with the forecast, both OPC and model. So here is the big deal, the hard part, the the fundamental part. To make these comparisons and have them be productive, our wind instruments have to be correct. And that's a lot of work because we need true wind direction. True wind direction. So that means your heading sensor and your speed sensor have to be right so you can calculate the true wind. And so, so one, and again, we have to also think about the timing. The most recent OPC map is, a, is about three and a half hours old when we get it, as, as I recall, something like that. And so that means that when you want to compare your, your wind speed and pressure and so forth to a si system ana uh, uh, analysis, uh, service analysis from the OPC, you have to be looking at data that was three and a half hours ago or six hours ago or whenever you got it. So that means, and it just brings to the front the fundamental point that underway for good weather work, we, we, we need to record in a logbook or digit somehow the, all the weather conditions, our, our position and the, uh, the barometer and the wind speed and the, so forth at the synoptic times. Those are always our key times that we want to compare what did we measure with what did the scientists tell us should be. And now the model data is like four or five hours old. It's older because they have to process it a little bit. And then here's a kind of a thought or something to play with and think about. If you ask for the model data like GFS, zero to 96 hours, you would get it in about four hours. It'd be like four hours old. But if you tack on, say, I want it, not 96 hours, I want 100 hours or 128 hours, that's going to crack add a whole hour to your whole data set. So because it kind of comes in those blocks. But anyway, so we would do the same thing. We would, get a, we would get a model. But now the whole process, see, this is going to take a little bit of work, which I'm going to show in a moment. Because it, they don't, they're not going to have wind vectors all over these maps. They're just going to have a few. Whereas we got a specific point on that map where we want to know what did it read. Whereas this one, the comparing our data, our observations with the model forecast is easier because we just download the most recent map, which will be like four hours old, 
And then we do, and let's say that was, turns out it was five hours and 30 minutes ago or something like that, you did it. Then you just look at a GFS forecast, it's five hours and 30 minutes. So you set it up to your right time exactly, and then you can just compare it. So this type of check can be done just in, in minutes, in minutes. And again, it's something that's done kind of underway to keep an eye on, on the data. Here is a, a, new, a new, relatively new program. Uh, I, just, I just want to mention that it's a, it's a commercial product that helps, is designed to help do that. And it's designed originally, I guess, for expedition, where you take all your, like you sail overnight, and you collect your expedition wind data and your pressure data in, uh, in a, a, a expedition logs all that. And then you copy that log file to some data file here. And then you uh, download uh, the GRIB file, the related GRIB file. And then this program will then go in. And it'll, it'll do the kind of hard work of matching up the times so that you, you're comparing apples to apples. And then it'll compare the, your, uh, what you measured with what was there. And it'll do three or four models at once. And so that's a, it, it, that's a way to test it. Now here, I did it just with a buoy. It also has a way that you can do it with buoy data. And so I did it with a buoy just to test it so I got to see how it works. And, uh, and here's comparison with, this is a buoy off the north, uh, uh, northwest of, uh, nor, excuse me, northeast of Hawaii. And, and it just, and this compares it. And then, uh, and so it's, a, it's a very interesting tool. It has a, a lot of value. Now. Um, this is something that's going to come up, so I'm going to say it. The buoy data, the, we, we, because the buoys are w w real information that we, we can check with, but keep, we have to keep in mind their uncertainty. The buoy data is documented uncertainty as a two knots or 10%, whichever is bigger. With, so that's a wind speed uncertainty in a buoy report that we get in National Data Buoy Center. And with a wind direction, 10 degrees, 10 degrees. Okay. Now let's start with, OK, now we want to start looking at ship, ship, uh, ship reports. This is, the, this is the map, the color map. These are both OPC maps. They're both the same map. This is, um, this is a color version. And what I want to look at the ship reports. And I've got this blown up here and here. The other thing to note, the, the ship report, OK, excuse me, let me back up a minute. This map here, the black and white, is the one that sail docks will provide us at 50% reduction. So you ask for it with the right code, like I think it's I like send PYBAO3.tiff or something like that. And it'll send it to us, but they reduce it 50%. So that helps with the uh, transmission times and so forth. But, but these are black and white. But that, look what happens. These buoy, these uh, ship reports get uh, uh, shortened, much shortened. And I'm going to. This, this slides, like I say, you can. Re, um, uh, I'm going to look at these two. And so here, and again, without going, I'm not going to go into this because you can go get the slide then and look at that. But here's just the idea is we want to look at this just to get a feeling for what's going on with the map itself. In other words, are there ship reports or are there no ship reports? Now, the other question is, do the ship reports agree with the isobars that's beside them? Now, it turns out in these two here, I'm just going to, you can come, you'll see the slides and, and one more note I'll show. These don't agree. These, these if, if the wind, if this were really the wind isobars, the wind right here should be about 14 knots. This is 25. And, and like the, so they're off a little bit. So chances are the isobars are closer here than in reality. Maybe they're out here. Maybe this is an MS, what MSLET effect. I'm not sure. But now, but then down further down here, there was this other buoy. It turned out to be spot, you know, more or less spot on, plus or minus two, uh, the two knots. The other thing, very important to always remember, we have to keep reminding everybody in our classes, that this thing that says 20 knots here, two feathers, 20 knots, we have to think of that nominal 20 knots, nominal 20 knots. That symbol could represent anything from 17.5 knots to 22.5 knots. That, and, and then recall that when the force of the wind is proportional to the wind speed squared. So 17.5 to 22.5 is a big difference. Again, 
That's why we like, if we can convince ourselves that the model's good, that's why we like that data. You just put your cursor on it, and it's going to say, you know, it's 18.2 knots, you know, the forecast. So that, that is that. This now is just a reminder of a table that's in this book about how you do, how you in, figure out what the wind speed should be on a map based on isobars and latitude. So if you're at a point here, you measure, you measure that distance. And to be convenient, you measure it in terms of latitude degrees, like this way, like three degrees or something. And then you need to know the latitude. Then you can go into this table. And then you say it was two degrees apart, 35 degrees, should be 28 knots. And what that is, this is a geostrophic wind. We heard about that this morning. That's a geostrophic wind. And this is, converts it to surface wind because of friction slows it down. Now, the mention that ones that Ken mentioned with the maps that have a diagrams and so forth, I just need to point out, they tend to use a number like 0.6. That's why I write this in a funny way. Instead of writing 32, I write 0.8 times 40. Because this is a geostrophic, and this is the fudge factor to make it surface winds. And, and we just have, for years now, have switched that to 0.8, because we look at the, a lot of these over and over again and found that that's better. And again, this can all be tested. So because you could get out, get out a, GFS, a GFS picture of the isobars and the wind vectors, and then just sample it. In other words, what is the gradient right here, and what should that wind be? measure it, calc compare it to the formula, and so forth. You can just do it and decide if it's right or wrong. We have small corrections. Okay. Oh, there's all small. And these corrections are in the book. There's tables. The, the curvature of the isobar can change the wind speed, and also the stability of the air. And then we had this morning, or we had very good criteria outlined for what's to stable air, I believe, this morning. And that will tweak this. Uh, ten for, not much, though. Each of these are like 10% corrections. So that's the, that's the bulk number. OK, now, now, now we're still in the comparing, comparing observations. And this is a background program expedition. And expedition, am I right? Let me, yes, yes, the expedition. Expedition is a navigation, a racing navigation program, has a unique feature, to my knowledge, unique to all navigation programs, that you can push a button, and then he goes and just displays that fast, bam, all the buoys in the water, in the ocean, and loads in their wind speed and pressure, and if they've got waves, you know, things like that. All that data is there, just loaded automatically. Now, this is looking forward to what's called S412, <laughs> which you may have seen just at the end of Joe's talk, the last slide he didn't get to, S412, and that can come up in the discussion in the discussion. But in the future, we're going to have this data, everybody. But right now, Expedition has it uniquely. We have other ways to get it, which I'm going to show you. But you push that button, then, well, after you push the button, then, then you've got your, grib mo your, your model forecast overlaid on it. Then your job is, you can't just look at them. You have to say, what time was this? This was at 2140. So I have to go up here and set Expedition, or whatever program you're using, to be 2140. I can't compare 12 o'clock to 1400 or something. I've got to do them at the right time. So when I go to this buoy, I may have to bump this up to like something else. Right? So that's the way you compare those. Again, this reminder, like that. And sure enough, here's a, t a random test case just done to, for the make a slide and exactly what you see at National Data Buoy Center. So it's quite a nice tool. Here now is, again, sail docks. I have to. <laughs> I, have to always, I always have to praise sail docks as revolutionized, uh, revolutionized uh, modern marine weather. Um, we can get the, uh, any of these buoys we want uh, directly from sail docks. And, you could, uh, and they come out, look at this, real nice reports like this. And you can write, and again, you can come back and look at this uh, and the slides that are online. And then you could also, this just is going to send you one copy of it, one buoy per line. Or you can write a format like this and send that off. And that will subscribe it, saying, for one whole day, starting at 1140 GMT, the next 1140 GMT, whatever that is, Every hour, send me that buoy report. 
and that'll just come boom, 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 boom. And then you could be prepared and be watching how the winds are developing in the trades ahead of you or, or, or wherever you're going. Now we come to something, this is a custom free service that we provide at our school for many years now, and it's called the ship reports. And what you do is you send an email to shipreports at starpath.com, and the subject line is the latitude and longitude you care about. Could be where you are, it could be someplace else. And you just send that email like that. And then that server is checked every minute on the whole minute, and after that minute, you get your answer back. So you get back an email that tells you every ship report that was turned in over the past six hours within 300 nautical miles of your position. And it gives you all the, all the data of that. Plus, something we added just like last year or something, we now make a GPX file, a GPX file that you can load into any navigation program, and it'll plot these buoys on there with the data. And it's all just a free service, and it's very nice. You'll notice this. For example, this comes out pressure in inches. And is this like, this could be like, uh, well, no, that looks like knots. That looks like knots. But uh, OK, so what, what we do then, in the GPX file, we convert that inches to millibars for you. And then you just load that GPX. Here's its, here it's loaded into the program OpenCPN. By the way, I just realized something. I, I think I forgot to say, or didn't stress maybe. The, G, the loading of the map, you know, to make the comparison of the forecast model, the forecast grid file, with the OPC maps, we need to have that map loaded in the program and geo-referenced. Now, the program expedition has a button. You push a button, and it brings it up. Also, it brings up beautiful satellite photos. And I'm not getting into that subject today, but it's really part of the evaluation as well. But it brings it up. The other thing I want to stress is here is a free program called OpenCPN at opencpn.org. It's a, a navigation program and a lot of weather features. It also has a button you can push. You know, but it also has maps, all kinds of maps, satellite photos, everything else from all over the world. You push a button, bang, it downloads it, geo-references it, puts it on there. You put your grid files right on top of it and compare them. And here's a case where I've just loaded the, the GPX of, the, of, the, of the, um, these ship reports. And so, and then you learn things. And then you roll over your mouse over it or something, and you read the wind speed and so forth. You will also, by doing this, you will also see, oh, let me back up one other detail. The expedition program, when it loads the buoys, it loads only the latest set, the latest set of buoys for the most recent. And it stores them. But, 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 but then if you, two or three hours later, do it again, it'll load the latest again. But you're then, at the time, looking at only the latest. But it has the earlier ones stored. So you could look at that. But here, what we do is we've we got these past six hours, so you can actually identify ships, which way they're going. So that not only do I have his report here, but I know up here I'm going to have some data that I might care about over here. The other thing, too, and you can play with this and study it here and look at the color code. That's the hint and so forth. But you can read these ship reports. Again, what you have to do with your GPS with your navigation program, you have to set it. When I'm looking at the 1400Z, I have to set that program to 1400Z. When I want to look at the 1800Z, set the program to 1800Z. And then you do that comparison. And you got the pressure at each of these points. And I'll leave it at an exercise to show that from these ship reports, if we assume their stuff is right and they're pretty good, then this isobar is wrong. It should be about here. Anyway, you can do subtle things like that the more you practice. Now, ASCAT, now we're going to want to compare the data to ASCAT. Now, the truth meter. But this is a phenomenal service. You've heard it talked about all day by everybody. But to use a, for us laymen to use it, there is a learning curve. The professionals have all their equipment set up, and it does what they want automatically. For us, the data is there, but nothing is really automatic. 
we have, to, we have to spend a little time on it. And I'll reference our own textbook, because we, knowing or feeling how important this is, we have a huge section on ASCAD, huge. And, uh, and so it, the, the satellites, this has been discussed. There's a nadir gap because the satellite, it only reads data on each side. You got data going up, and you got data coming down, you know, and so forth. And then here's the graphic image for like this little, this little unit. And all the data that's online are in little units like this, like a little checkerboard like that. I'll show you in one moment. And they look like this without this annotation. And the valid time, again, like I say, learning curve. Uh, there's a time, this, OK, the, the time that's up here is the time that this index, this graphic index, was updated. And that's updated every hour. And that shows about uh, 22 hours, maybe about 13 passes. It's an hour and uh, an hour, it's 103 minutes to do a loop. So this is one of those. So this little teeny, teeny purple number down there is the actual GMT that that data was taken. And then you have to compare that GMT to this GMT. Is it on the same day, or is this yesterday? So forth. Now, we can also get this data in a GRIB format, in a GRIB format. Several programs will do that for us, and we can get the GRIB format. And that's very nice. Here's an expedition case. Expedition will download the, the GRIB data here. I mean the ASCAT data. And then th this is ASCAT and GFS. And, but again, always you have to set the program to be exactly the right time. Because this pass of the ASCAT is at one time only. <laughs> one time only. So if you don't understand that, I'm not even going to see it on the screen until I set the program to exactly that time. And then I can look at the GFS and this. And then here's what we see. Look, the GFS and ASCAT's agreeing pretty well here. And down here, they don't agree. They don't agree. And, that's, that may, and, and here now, we don't have to say, like, is the OPC right or is the GFS right? We don't have to say that here. Here, the GFS is wrong <laughs> down here. Because these are actual, the ASCAT's actual measurements of the wind speed and direction and so forth. So, but now the, a little bit of the subtleties. This beautiful digital GRIB format of this uh, ASCAT is at best 15 hours old. And that would be you happen to catch it just at the right time. So it could be 15, 16, 17 hours old. These images here can be as, or as not, I mean, like maybe three hours, two and a half, three hours old. So these graphic images, even though this is really, really nice, you, these, this, this stuff here is much newer. The graphic ones are much newer. And with little practice, uh, it's a little hard to tell from this image, but, but this color scale along here is very good. It actually works. You can, you can do that. So what we have done in our textbook is we've taken the world and divided it up in all the little files that ASCAT uses. And this is like, you obviously have too much time on your hands or something, <laughs> you know, something like that. But the value of this is you can now use uh, sale docs to get any one of these files by, uh, by, a, by a request. And so like this file here, you would send this command like that. And this covers A, B, and C are the three satellites. You change AS to DS, uh, 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 ascending or descending. And now the point, and now, and OK, so that's that. But you don't know. The problem is you never know when you're going to have valid data. But that can be worked out, again, emphasizing the learning curve and the, and the practice, the practice involved. Here's the point. If you're doing a race like a Puerto Vallarta race or something like that coming up, you could have this all laid out ahead of time and know exactly when each, when you're going to get new data at each time that's useful. And it's all laid out. And the trick to that is using a satellite tracker program. And we, I use one. This is a young kid in Japan that makes this program here. And this links will do it, but it's a very awkward interface to his own personal work. 
But these, these are trackers. And then this slide I made just to kind of show, these are not exactly the tracks, but they're sort of similar. But you see, there's A, B, and C, and uh, you can study that and, and figure out what the frequencies are. All right, now let's go back, I'm back to step two. Yes, that, oh, I've got to, actually, I've got to skip this. I've got to skip the shape of the atmosphere here because, or, or yeah, I'm going to have to skip this. We've discussed this. Here's a point. This kind of flow, I, I apologize. I'm going to go rush here because I've got to get to the new stuff. This is a, uh, the, this is a type of fa flow aloft that is dependable. This is a kind that's not dependable or more uncertain forecast. And now here's the case where I just did one where here's a very like a sort of dependable, and here's one that breaks up. And then I want to look at actual forecast of this 72, about 72 hours out right here. Now, and so here's a global ensemble model. I'll leave these slides to be read. What it is, it's the same model, but it's run with 21 different initial conditions that were discussed here, the butterfly, you know, little differences in the data input or the model or the physics. And the output, we get the control, the one that they put in, which in this was going to be similar to the GFS, not identical. And then, uh, and then we get the mean of all the members. That's the, this would go this this would go you know this way, this way, and this way, and then this average. That's the mean of all the members. And then here's the key one, the standard deviation. And I'll leave that for here. Now here is that wind. Here is that wind at like. Uh, that, that, that point we were looking at in the forecast of 72 hours of things split. We see the wind very good, 14 plus or minus 2. That's the standard deviation. That's as good as it gets. That's, it, it can't get better than 2. But look what happened here. Right around 80, somewhere around 70, 80 hours, this just blows up. This, here the wind is 14 knots plus or minus 14. So they, in other words, the wind is not known at this point, and this model's telling us that. Uh, then let me go next. Oh, and here I just showed that it's, it's not true that all long-term forecasts blow up. Go to some place where the wind is dependable, like the, like the trades down here, and you see they stay small all along. Now, now here's the next. So we have the, we have the ensemble model, the, the Jeff's ensemble, looking at mainly the standard deviation. Now here's the national blend of models, and this includes uh, well, this is just the oceanic part. This includes the Jeffs. This also includes this uh, European model here. All these models are included. And it's different than the ensemble model because the ensemble model is all the same model. And then the, 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 the control, or not the control, the mean that you're getting is actually an average. It's an average of those data. Whereas in this one, the one they call 50% probable wins are not an average. These aren't averages. These are a more sophisticated way to combine these models, which are designed to minimize the biases in the models. So it's a, and, and they have a web page, and there's references and things like that. So this is now, now we get, again, it's 11, 11, kilom 11 kilometers, too. Is pretty, that's like twice the resolution of GFS. In one sense, I think one could argue that this might be the best long-term ocean data available, period, in the world, any country. Um, and this goes out, uh, and so we get P10. All right, so here's what P10 means in this particular distribution. P10 means there is a 10% probability that the wind is greater than 18 knots. There is, and then this is like 50% between 50, this is all the 50% is between 7 and 14 knots. So you see you have probabilities, probabilis probabilistic forecasting. Now, okay, now let's do, now do the demo. This is a, a spot here on the map, and here's the GFS. What, this is, GFS we've described deterministic. You're going to get it out an answer, period. And the answer is at this wind, there's this, uh, that's a pressure, and that's a wind speed and direction. But now, let's look at the uh, oceanic for the same point, same time frame. So you see what happens right here is all very good. All, you know, this is all very close. The wind, in other words, the wind here, <clears throat> 16, the wind here is 16 to 17.7. Uh, and here, the wind is uh, 6.3 to 
in the, in the 50 percent range. So you see, this has shown us <clears throat> that this particular model is dependable up until about here. And after that, this is really blowing up like that. And so it's a guideline about when we for sure have to download a new one and run another uh, 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 run. Uh, here's what is this now. Oh, OK, so that was, now I'm just bouncing back a minute to look at that same probabilistic study, but with the GIFs, looking at standard deviation from the ensemble forecast to see if it confirms what we learned from the blend of models. And the answer is, indeed it does, right? Here is um, two, two knots, and here is again 15, uh, th oh, OK. It's three knots plus or minus 15. So this shows you, you can run this model out to about here, not more. And, and also, so, that, so one idea here is you've got two ways to check. You can check with the National Blend of Models Oceanic version and check with the GEFs uh, uh, that way. And then, oh, OK, one last example, if I may. Now we're going to uh, regional models. And this, now, talk about new, new data. Have you, so you have latest and greatest. This is about four days old. They added, the, the, the uh, National Blend of Models CONUS added standard deviation parameter about five days ago for the first time. And I want to, sh and I, I have to send this to them and show them how cool <laughs> their product is. So this is that section of that, and we're looking at just the, um, uh, just the wind, right? So I'm looking at the, the National Blend of Models. I'm looking at the CONUS, the wind. They don't have, the CONUS doesn't have probabilistic winds. It does not have, that's only in the oceanic version. This is the one that includes the National Digital Forecast Database, the HER. The HER model's all in this as well, and so forth. So now, now what I've plotted is this brand new parameter called the uh, standard D, well, not <laughs> It is standard deviation. And in the, so these colors now are not the wind speed, they're the standard deviation. So here's Baja like this, and we see that this wind here, 1.4, that's as good as it ever gets. This wind is known. That's 1.4, here's like three. But look at this strange behavior. There's this patch of wind here and up here where the standard deviation shoots up to 5.1 knots. So it's warning us that even though they know the wind real well here, you're going to enter into a zone where the wind becomes very uncertain. And you, Now, then the idea is, what could be causing that? What could be causing that weird behavior? So then we go to Google Earth. <laughs> oh, and I call that point Lower Valley. Gap wind, right? The magic word we heard throughout the day. And, just, and it, this was like a really fantastic discovery to then zoom in on this, and there's the lower valley point, and here's 1,000 feet, actually 1,200, 1,000, 1,200, 1,000, 1,200, 100 feet, right in front of that gap. And what happens, and you can easily imagine that, when you have a valley like that, the amount of channeling is very sensitive to the input angle. You know, if you go right down there, you get a lot. You get up just to 10 degrees up like that, and it maybe shuts off. So that large uncertainty came about because of the gap. Let's see what else I have. That's all. But so here's a summary of the new stuff. This new pressure concept, the GEFs with standard deviation, o National Blend of Models Oceanic, that CONUS, brand new CONUS with standard deviation. These types of apps that are trying to help you compare your data to different models. And then looking ahead to this, what is now this mysterious S412. And uh, I'm going to leave that, and then everybody's leaving that, but maybe it'll come up in the discussions. And a reminder, the articles are online. Oh, I forgot to, one last thing, if I may. There's a, we have a free barometer app. And you can download that app. It's called Marine Barometer. And then I will pull out my barometer, which is calibrated, and tell you what the pressure is. Then you can set your barometer in your phone with that app, and you'll have the most probably, the, you know, the most accurate, or one of the most accurate barometers on the boat. And that will be, you'll do millibar type work. And I, I'll, I'll do that. I'm sorry I'm running late. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> Terrific.